You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Volk. Here he is. Jacob Volk. Jacob Volk Show. I am Jacob Volk. And I have to start with some interesting NFL news. Specifically, news surrounding the future Hall of Famer We don't think of him as a future Hall of Famer, but he is. Russell Wilson. On Super Bowl Sunday, before the game started, Ian Rappaport and Tom Pelissero of NFL.com reported that a couple teams had placed calls to the Seahawks about trading for Russell Wilson. Now, the Seahawks turned those teams away. And it's important to note that I don't think there's any way on this earth that the Seahawks are going to trade Russell Wilson. They'd be absolutely insane to trade him. I don't care what haul you get I don't see it happening. I think the Seahawks are too smart for that. At the end of the day, you can't stop teams from calling. But you can tell them, yeah, that's not going to happen. But there were some interesting follow-ups to that. Yesterday, Jason Lockhanfora of CBSSports.com said that Wilson is upset that the Seahawks haven't been able to put together a good offensive line to protect him. Supposedly, there are people around Wilson that are concerned about his long-term health, and his long-term potential to win another Super Bowl. And Wilson said in an interview that he did on the Dan Patrick show that he wants to be involved more in the Seahawks roster construction. A few hours after that interview, and this is when... I really started paying attention to this story. Rappaport said that Wilson was upset at the initial stages of the Seahawks offensive coordinator search. They fired Brian Schottenheimer. They cast a really wide net in replacing him. They interviewed some smart guys, guys like Ken Dorsey, Mike Kafka, and Shane Waldron, who ultimately got the job. But they also interviewed some interesting guys, to put it lightly. Adam Gase, Joe Lombardi, and Kirby Wilson. Now, Rappaport did say that Wilson was involved in bringing in Waldron. And I think Waldron's going to do a good job at the Seahawks. 
comes from the Sean McVay coaching tree, has held a bunch of different positions throughout his football career, tight ends coach, wide receivers coach, offensive line coach, passing game coordinator. Waldron seems like a smart guy. So the Seahawks got the hire right. They just went about it in a weird way. There were really two elements to this that you need to break down. Does Wilson have a right to be upset? And should players have a say in personnel decisions? I'll attack the former first. Russell Wilson has no right to be upset that teams called about him. At the end of the day, John Schneider can't stop other GMs from calling him. You know those calls you get from those robot telemarketers? You can try your best to stop them, but some of them are going to get through. It's the same principle. You can't stop someone from dialing your phone number and asking about Russell Wilson. The only thing you can do in that case is say, you're nuts, we're not going to trade him under any circumstances, it's a ridiculous ask, go screw yourself, click. But if that's not Schneider's M.O., and he wants to let the other GMs down gently, okay, you know, John Schneider is a very well-respected GM, one of the best GMs in the sport, His methods work. It doesn't really matter how you get there. It just matters if you get there. And the getting there entails telling the opposing GM there's no way we're trading Russell Wilson. Now, do I understand why Wilson would be upset the teams were calling about him? The answer is yes, and... It's something that every Seahawks fan on earth should love. Russell Wilson loves playing in Seattle. The guy ends every interview with Go Hawks. It's the only team he's ever known. This is a team that drafted him in the third round despite giving Matt Flynn a big contract. And on opening day, his rookie year... Wilson got the start and hasn't looked back. He loves being a Seahawk. He made two Super Bowls as a Seahawk. He destroyed the Broncos at MetLife Stadium as a Seahawk. I mean, the one thing I'll say is John Schneider and Pete Carroll could call Russell Wilson And say, hey, just so you know, we're not going to trade you. There's no way on this earth we're trading you. We want you to retire as a Seahawk. We want you to be a lifetime Seahawk. We look forward to the day that we're going to retire the number three. There's no legs to this. Is that really necessary for Schneider and Carroll to do? No. I mean, that really seems like a hand-holdy thing to do. Is it an unreasonable ask? The answer is no, but it's not necessary. Like I said, it's hand-holdy. But now to the other element. Should players get a say in personnel decisions? The answer is sometimes. 
Not all the time. But sometimes. Tom Brady was given a lot of say within the Buccaneers. They traded for Gronkowski. They brought in Antonio Brown. They just won a Super Bowl. And in the NBA, it happens all the time. But it's not empirical. If your franchise quarterback wants you to sign Player X, and you don't want Player X, you think Player X is a bad player, he's asking for too much money, you don't want him, then you have to let the quarterback down gently. I mean, the last thing you want if you're any team is a Deshaun Watson situation where you alienated this superstar quarterback and now he wants out. Part of being a good leader is making sure that everyone feels heard even if you didn't listen to them. At the end of the day, Russell Wilson is an employee, a superstar employee, One of the best quarterbacks in football. Like I said, future Hall of Famer. He deserves to be heard. He's not the 53rd guy on the roster. If you're John Schneider or Pete Carroll, you don't need to be beholden to him, but you do need to listen to him. And Russell Wilson has a valid concern when it comes to his offensive line. This guy has been sacked over 45 times the last three seasons. 2018, 51 times. 2019, 48 times. That led the league. Last year, he was sacked 47 times. He has been sacked a grand total of of 394 times. That is the most by a quarterback in his first nine seasons in the NFL. And it's really not that close. The guy behind him, Randall Cunningham, got sacked 366 times. There were a bunch of Seahawks losses this year that were directly because the Seahawks didn't do a good job protecting Russell Wilson. The Rams lost. Wilson got sacked six times. The Bills and Giants losses. Wilson got sacked five times. Their loss to the Rams in the playoffs. Wilson got sacked five times. The primary starting offensive line for the Seahawks this year was Dwayne Brown, Mikey Upati, Ethan Posich, Damian Lewis, and Brandon Shell. Of those five guys, only the tackles, Brown and Shell, had a pro football focus pass blocking grade of over 63. And once you get to the low to mid-60s, you're just average. Even a guy like Damian Lewis, who the Seahawks are really high on, had a 47 pass-blocking grade, according to Pro Football Focus. Wilson has a valid concern with his offensive line. He's not getting any younger. He's 32 years old. He wants to win more. The reason the Seahawks didn't beat the Rams was partially because the Seahawks had a dreadful offensive line. Now, part of that was because Sean McVay called a fantastic game. And the Seahawks defense was dreadful. They gave up 30 points. The Seahawks were garbage in that game. They have a lot of holes. 
But two of those holes are at left guard and center. According to OverTheCap.com, as of this very moment, the Seahawks only have a little over $4 million in cap room. So if you covet a guy like Joe Thune, Corey Lindsley, or Austin Ritter, you're going to have to perform some salary cap magic to make that work. You want to tell me you can draft some offensive linemen? Of course you can. No question. That's how you got Damian Lewis. But realize... The Seahawks only have four picks this year. They're second, they're fourth, they're fifth, and they're sixth. You'll be lucky to find one really good offensive lineman with those four picks. They kind of need to use free agency. All in all, Wilson has a right to be upset with the Seahawks that they haven't done a good job protecting him, because they haven't. There's no question. And the offensive line is something that John Schneider and Pete Carroll are going to need to address this year. Namely, left guard and center. But I don't think you have to worry about anything crazy happening. I think Russell Wilson is destined to be a Seahawk for life. Moving on now to another quarterback. A quarterback that I am stunned is generating trade interest, but according to Ian Rappaport, he is. And that is Marcus Mariota. How desperate are these teams that they're looking at Marcus Mariota at a legitimate starting option for next season? Look, I like Mariota. I really do. I think he's one of the best backups in the NFL. And backup quarterback is the most underrated position in the NFL. You need a good one. You never know when he's going to be called upon. But that's just it. Mariota's a backup. This guy has only started six games since 2019. People are supposedly impressed by what he did against the Chargers. It was an impressive performance, there's no question, but... The Raiders still lost, basically killed their playoff hopes, and also, it was one game. Matt Flynn and Scott Mitchell eat your heart out. Look, I'll say this. If you're a team like the Patriots, or Washington, or Chicago, or the Colts. You're in the lower part of the draft. You have a question mark at quarterback. It does make sense to trade for Mariota, draft a quarterback like Trey Lance, Kyle Trask, or Mac Jones. You let Mariota start for a little bit, and then the young kid takes over. I don't mind that. I think that makes sense. Are there other quarterbacks that could do that? Yeah, Tyrod Taylor, Ryan Fitzpatrick, Andy Dalton, C.J. Beathard, and Taylor Heineke. But if you really like Mariota, fine. Trade for him. Give up a fourth round pick at most. In a perfect world, that would be a conditional fourth. 
and let him duke it out with the young quarterback. I don't mind that, but if you're going to roll with Marcus Mariota as your unquestioned starter, that's not going to work. I do like Mariota. I do. But the notion that he should be the unquestioned starter is ludicrous. Moving on now to Orlando Brown requesting a trade. Holy nightmare scenarios, Batman. Holy nightmare scenarios. Orlando Brown is one of the best offensive tackles in the NFL. He's 24 years old. He's gotten better every year he's been in the NFL. Last year, according to Pro Football Focus, he had a 76.4 overall grade. He never had a single game where his grade was under 61. That's really, really impressive. And you want to talk about quarterbacks needing protection? Lamar Jackson needs protection. Scrambling quarterback, going to get hit a lot, takes a while to get rid of the football. Jackson's in danger of getting that one really nasty hit and his whole career can change. I don't want that to happen, but it is a real concern with a quarterback like Jackson. The reason Brown wants out is because he wants to play left tackle. Now, he played left tackle a lot last year, but that's because Ronnie Stanley only played in six games. With Stanley coming back, Brown's going to be asked, to slide over to right tackle. A position that he played almost exclusively in 2018 and 2019. There is an obvious fix to this. I'm not sure how it would work. But why can't Stanley move over to right tackle? I understand that Stanley has exclusively played left tackle all throughout his NFL career. And Stanley's one of the best offensive tackles in the game. No question. Elite pass blocker. But you saw Brown make the transition... From right tackle to left tackle seamlessly. And Stanley seems like the kind of guy with the sheer talent to move over to right tackle. Would he be as effective? Maybe not, but... I think he'd still be above average. Last year, in six games, Stanley had an 80 overall grade. In 2019, he had an 89.4 overall grade. Even if you knock 10 points off that overall grade, you have a really good offensive tackle on your hands. Now, I don't know how Stanley would feel about that, The Ravens are kind of beholden to Stanley. They signed him to a five-year contract worth just under $100 million. They're not moving on from that that quickly. But this seems like the kind of thing that could be easily fixed. Assuming it is that simple, then you've got to wonder what Orlando Brown was thinking. Why would you go public with this? Just to push the issue? That's not the right way to do it. You don't make a public trade request through Ian Rappaport. Rappaport's getting all the shoutouts here. 
Take it up, Schefter. <laughs> but that's not the right way to do it. If Stanley doesn't want to move, okay, then I understand the issue. And there would be a bunch of teams lining up to trade for Orlando Brown. The Ravens would get a king's ransom for him. I don't think a first-round pick is out of the question. But I do think this can be solved pretty easily. If I'm the Ravens, I really wouldn't want to move on from Brown. Something tells me Stanley could play right tackle very easily. And that solves this whole thing. So... Brown didn't go about this the right way, but there is a clear path to him being the Ravens starting left tackle come September. Speaking of the Ravens, they signed the former Jet, Eric Tomlinson, to a one-year deal worth $1,015,000. And this is a good move for the Ravens. Tomlinson doesn't offer a lot in terms of pass catching. He's been in the league since 2016. He's only caught 17 passes. One of those came with the Patriots. 16 of them came with the Jets. I remember Tomlinson with the Jets. I actually liked him. But he is a good blocking tight end. And the Ravens have Mark Andrews to be the receiving tight end. Tomlinson was mostly a run blocker last year. In that role, according to Pro Football Focus, he had a 70.4 overall grade. We all know the Ravens love to run the ball. They need to keep Tomlinson around. While Nick Boyle will be presumably fully healthy for this coming season, you still want to keep a guy like Tomlinson around if you're the Ravens. Played an important role for him down the stretch and in the playoffs. This isn't a lot of money. It only guarantees him $125,000. This is a good move for the Ravens. It makes perfect sense. All right, now I'll give you some NHL Vault talk. And I usually don't like talking about just one story in a sport, but I have to do it here because the Penguins made some new additions to their front office. Jim Rutherford resigned last month, and the Penguins replaced him by hiring Brian Burke as their president of hockey operations, and Ron Hextall as their GM. So Ron Hextall, the Flyers legend, The guy who Penguins fans hated when he was a goalie is now going to be Penguins GM. I guess Tom Barrasso was unavailable. In all seriousness, though, this could work. You've got two guys in high positions with two completely different philosophies. Brian Burke is an insanely aggressive hockey man. He made the trade for Phil Kessel. He made the trade for James Van Riemsdyk. John Michael Lyles. Joffrey Lupo. If you're an owner and you want to win now, you'd be hard-pressed to find a better guy to do that than Brian Burke. On the flip side of that coin is Ron Hextall. 
a guy who tried to build the Flyers up slowly didn't make a lot of blockbuster trades. He tried to build through the draft. The thing is, though, under Burke and under Hextall, the Leafs and the Flyers never won a playoff series. In fact, Burke's aggressiveness really got him in trouble with the Leafs towards the end. A lot of Leafs fans turned on him. They said, oh, how could this guy go from winning a Stanley Cup with the Ducks to doing this terrible of a job for the Leafs? And they had a right to be upset. Hextall got some heat, just not as much heat as Burke got. There were a lot of people that wanted Hextall to be more aggressive. So if you combine those two philosophies, you have a perfect marriage. It's not always right to damn the torpedoes and go full speed ahead. But it's also not always right to sit on your hands and do nothing. There is a happy medium. And that's one of the biggest things you can do in terms of being in charge of a team. Knowing when you should sit on your hands and build through the draft and when. You should be very aggressive. The only issue I have is who's going to break the tie. Burke is theoretically above Hextall. So Burke may be the one to say, you know what, we're going to go out and trade two first rounders for player X. Now, Hextall can voice his objection to that. But at the end of the day, if that's what Burke wants to do, there's not much Hextall can do to stop him. What I would do, if I was Penguin's owner, is I would say to a guy like Mario Lemieux, Hey, I want you to be the deciding vote here. If there's a disagreement, which there's going to be, and there's nothing wrong with that, it's good to have that lively exchange of different ideas. So when there's that disagreement, you settle the tie. I understand that may upset Burke since... He's the president of hockey operations, and he really wouldn't have final say, but I do think that's what's best for the Penguins. You don't want either guy having full autonomy. If one guy is going to have full autonomy, it should be Burke, but I'd rather there be a third voice in that room, just to settle the tie. And only if he's called upon to do it. If Burke convinces Hextall that being aggressive is the way to go, fine. No issue. If Hextall convinces Burke that sitting back is the way to go, no problem. But if there's an ardent disagreement, that's when the tiebreaker would come into play. All right, now I'll give you some MLB Vault talk. And I'll start with the Marlins signing Adam Duvall to a one-year deal worth $5 million. And this makes sense for the Marlins. The Marlins did have a hole in right field. How much can you really trust 
Jesus Sanchez. In 25 at-bats last year, he only had one hit. I understand limited sample size, but still, that doesn't inspire confidence. And the Marlins haven't done a good job in scouting outfielders. Lewis Brinson failed. Magnura Sierra seems to be topping out as a backup. Monty Harrison failed. Yeah, it makes sense for them to go out and add another veteran to pair with Corey Dickerson and Starling Marte. Duvall is a very good power hitter. In 2019 for the Braves, he played in 41 games. He had 10 home runs. Last year, he played in 57 games, had 16 home runs. You're not going to get a high average from him. He's a career 233 hitter, and he doesn't get on base a lot. But he's a guy with a ton of power. The Marlins did need that. Outside of Brian Anderson, they really didn't have a true power threat last year. Five mil is more than fair for Duvall. I think this can work. And this does give the Marlins the flexibility to try Sanchez again if he rakes in AAA. The last story to talk about is the Giants signing Jake McGee to a two-year deal worth $7 million. And this is a really good move by the Giants. Jake McGee is a talented pitcher. Don't let his time with the Rockies fool you. It's Coors Field. No one pitches well in Coors Field. And the Rockies can't sign free agents anyway. They're a dysfunctional organization. McGee has talent. Was really good with the Rays. And last year with the Dodgers, he was really good too. Went 3-1 with a 2-6-6 ERA. Wasn't great in the playoffs. Pitched two and two-thirds innings, gave up a run. He wasn't great. He wasn't awful. But McGee has talent. He knows the NL West. The Giants took him away from a division rival. The one thing I'll say is the Giants do have a lot of lefties in their bullpen now. McGee, Wandy Peralta, Caleb Barragar, Sam Selman, and Tony Watson. But that's not the end of the world. Depth is important, especially in this coronavirus climate. You can never have too much pitching. We all know that. The contract is more than fair. This is a good move for the Giants. Until tomorrow, I am Jacob Volk saying, shout out to you, Therese Paler.